In 1901, Ellen White stood before an audience of black people, and she said these words, In heaven, there will be no color line, for all will be as white as Christ himself. Now, our 21st century minds instantly jump up and say, what did she just say? White as Christ himself? Now, critics of Ellen White, they claim this statement is nothing but pure, unadulterated racism. White supremacy. We're all going to be white in heaven. Christ is white. We're going to be white like him. Is that really what she is saying here? This statement, especially in this climate today, needs our attention. Welcome to the Ellen White Podcast. Here is your host, Dr. Judd Lake. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Ellen White Podcast. I'm Judd Lake, your host, as you just heard, and I want to address this controversial topic. This is the beginning of a series on Ellen White and racism. That's a topic that is obviously a very sensitive one today, the issue of racism. And in its relationship to Ellen White, it's, it's being raised repeatedly by critics. There's a new wave of intensity on this subject, as well as criticisms in general of Ellen White. And I believe it's necessary to address that on this podcast. Last episode, I dealt with a theological statement with regard to the Trinity. And I mentioned the important principles of interpretation. Understanding the literary historical context. That's a theme, as I mentioned, uh, through this year. And I'm starting a a short series now on this issue of Ellen White and racism. I'm going to, first of all, this episode address this statement, why does Christ himself? That clearly needs a discussion. Next episode, I'm going to do a bonus episode here in a couple of weeks from this recording before my regular monthly uh, recording, uh, the 26th of each month or when it's released. And my subject then will be the color line. That's an essay in Testimonies, Volume 9. And that's where you have a lot of statements that are really controversial by Ellen White with regards to dealing with the black race at that time. It really needs analysis in its historical context. Now, there's many wonderful statements that she says. I'm going to share those statements with you when she speaks of of the oneness of humanity and, and that the black race are precious in the eyes of God, just like all other races. Those statements are the larger framework, but it's claimed that she contradicts herself in her statements on the color line in Testimonies, Volume 9, beginning at page 213. I'm going to address that because some will say, well, wait a minute, what about all the other statements? Well, I'm going to address those in my bonus episode, and then in a month, my regular episode, the next one will be the third and final part in this series on Ella White and racism. There's certainly much more we could talk about, but I I do want to to move on to to other things. Uh, I might come back to this subject, but but what I want to address, of course, is the fountainhead, if you will, of at least according to the critics of Ella White's racism, and that would be the famous statement, amalgamation of man and beast. If you've never heard of that before, it's like, what does that mean? Well, that statement also needs attention in its literary and historical context. So that's that's where I'm going with this at this point. So let's let's dive in here. 
What is going on? In heaven there will be no color line, she said, for all will be as white as Christ himself. Now, our 21st century mind, as I said, red flags pop up. What, what is she saying? That we're all going to be white-skinned in heaven and Christ is white-skinned? It's easy to do that. Um, of course, for critics, that's certainly a statement to exploit. But for those who are interested in Ellen White and respect Ellen White, it, it still is puzzling. But what we have to do, I believe, to be fair and honest with Ellen White is to try to put our minds in that setting, to understand what she was thinking when she said that. The audience that she was speaking to, the historical period in which she said that, and her own theological ideas. We've got to go back and put ourselves in that environment, that setting. And that, I believe, is the only way to be fair with what she is saying, because if we interpret it from our 21st century mindset right now and only take that sentence alone without looking at its a more immediate and larger literary historical context, you certainly could read racism into it. I personally, after reading Ellen White for 40-plus years, I've not seen that theme, any theme of racism in her writings. So I believe these statements need to be understood in their historical setting, in spite of, of the intensity of criticisms about a statement like this. But when I read and listen to the critics, and I do, I listen to the YouTube channels, I read the websites, read the writings, the books, carefully and listen try to put myself in their mindset and i can see how this is a troubling statement by itself but when you read it in its immediate context and then broaden out to the larger context i think it it brings clarity to what's happening here so what i want to do first is look at the larger literary context of her statements about the blacks and whites, about race, particularly the black race. And then I want to zero in to the immediate context and look at this statement in the entire document in which we find it, and then narrow down to the paragraph in which this sentence is in. And then I want to do some theological reflection and interpret this statement in light of parallel statements in her writings that I believe bring clarity to it and shed light upon her meaning. So let's begin with the larger literary context. Of course, there are many, many passages we could look at. You have the important book called Southern Work, where she focuses on, focuses on the work in the South. That's a compilation of a lot of things that she wrote, articles and essays during the 1890s. Now let's, let's step back and look at the, the larger historical setting. This is, of course, post-Civil War. Ellen White had a lot to say about the Civil War as it, as it was happening, especially at the beginning, and about uh, the Black race and the horrors of slavery. And I cover that in my book, A Nation in God's Hands, Ellen White in the Civil War. But this is all post-Civil War, decades after the Civil War ended. Now, if you know from history, after the Civil War ended, you have what is called the Reconstruction Period, where the Union, it was shattered, and they were reconstructing the South back into the Union. That was a turbulent time. A challenging time, it went till about the late 1870s. Then you have a new period uh, in the larger framework. It's That really is when the South kind of struck back. Uh, the official institution of slavery was gone with the Civil War, but you had uh, a subtle form of that through racism emerge in what is known as the Jim Crow era. That's what I'm going to get into in a lot of detail in terms of the historical setting 
in my next episode when I deal with her essay on the color line. Because that's the setting for this, the, the intense violence and hostility and racism, hostile racism, if you will, that was occurring, the whites against the blacks and so forth during that period. But what we find here, this statement, it occurs at a period when she was advocating Adventist reach out to the blacks, as well as whites in the South. So in terms of Adventist history, Ellen White's big concern was that after the Civil War, the Adventist church did essentially nothing for the South. And I will share this more in future episodes in this series. She said repeatedly, we should have reached out to the South right after the war. It would have been dangerous, but she said that's what we we should do. But the church had not done that. And so you go several decades, you come to to the uh, 1880s, and you hear various statements she makes about the importance of reaching out. And she was concerned because there was prejudice. There was some prejudice among Adventists, and the leadership of the church had essentially done nothing for the South. And so when you get to 1891, Ellen White has thought about this and has heard messages from the Lord about it, about what, how the church has neglected it and the sin of neglecting the work in the South, the blacks in the South, as well as the whites in the South, bringing the gospel message to them. So she, she launches a major discourse or message It's called Our Duty to the Colored People. And she delivered this message in 1891. And according to Delbert Baker, one of the major historians of the black work in SDA history and in the South, um, he calls this a watershed message. It changed the attitude of the church leadership. And as a result of this message, they, they began to reach out Uh, and begin work in the South. But it was too slow for Ellen White. She wanted work to be done. She had a burden for the black race. You You can hear that throughout numerous statements. She felt deeply for the suffering that they had been through. That's unquestionable as you read her writings. But I want to share with you a few select statements from the 1891, Our Duty to the Colored People, a watershed message. This is foundational here. But I'm only going to take excerpts that are relevant for the setting here, giving the the, uh, larger framework of her thinking about the black race, of what she called, of course, at that time and in that day, the colored people or the colored race. Here's something that she said that is most interesting. Oh, what impartial love the Lord Jesus gives to those who love him. The Lord's eye is upon all his creatures. He loves them all and makes no difference between white and black, except that he has a special tender pity for those who are called to bear a greater burden than others. It's quite clear. She indicates that the Lord, in her thinking, has a special tender pity for the black race and what they had experienced in the bondage of slavery in the antebellum South, the South before the war. And that relates to other things she said, which I won't have time to get into, but she often likens the freedom from slavery through the war. She calls it the providential freedom from slavery in the Civil War the work of Lincoln and, and the, the, the whole war itself. She calls that the providential working of God. She likens that to the exodus of Israel out of Egypt and sees a parallel there with the black people. Many interesting statements like that. It's clear that she has a burden for these people and, and believes the Lord has a special tender pity and love for these people 
that had experienced so much oppression. Another select statement from that 1891, our duty to the colored people. Whoever of the human family give themselves to Christ, whoever hear the truth and obey it, become children of one family. Notice the themes here, the oneness, the, the unity before God. The ignorant and the wise, the rich and the poor, the heathen and the slave, white or black, Jesus paid the purchase money for their souls. If they believe in him, his cleansing blood is applied to them. The black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. All are one in Christ. Birth, station, nationality, or color cannot elevate or degrade men. And this next sentence is a statement she would make often. The character makes the man. Then she goes on. If a red man, a Chinese, or an African gives his heart to God in obedience and faith, Jesus loves him nonetheless for his color. He calls him his well-beloved brother. The day is coming when the kings and the lordly men of the earth would be glad to exchange places with the humble African who has laid hold on the hope of the gospel. These are quite powerful statements. And when you think of them in their context, there were some leaders in the church, members in the Adventist church, who did not like what she was saying. And she knew she would get opposition. But she forged ahead anyway. So those are some key statements. Oh, and by the way, there is one other sentence in there that I think is most illuminating with regard to the subject that we're dealing with in this episode. Early in that document, our duty to the color people in 1891, she said, the color of the skin does not determine character in the heavenly courts. Again, I repeat, the color of the skin does not determine character in the heavenly courts. Now, this is years before she made the statement that we're focusing on now but I believe they're relevant to understanding it. She already is moving away from the color of skin. When it comes to heaven, when it comes to God and a relationship with God here and in the hereafter, skin has nothing to do with it. Now, this is from the book Southern Work, as I mentioned, that's a compilation of uh, her writings after this 1891 watershed statement, really most of her statements, a little before, mostly after, uh, in the 1890s, Review and Herald Articles, a series of articles that she wrote. Here are some, some powerful statements that give us that larger framework of her thinking about the black race and the white race. We are God's messengers. He has, set us, he has sent us forth to work for both the white and the black race, without partiality and without hypocrisy. We are to set forth the truth in warnings and entreaties. We are to point out the path of light in plain and simple language, easy to be understood by both white and black. We have no time to build up walls of distinction between the white and the black race. Then she says, God's object in bringing us to himself is to conform us to the image of Christ Jesus. All who believe in Christ will understand the personal relation that exists between them and their brethren. They are to be as branches grafted into the same parent stock to draw sustenance or sustenance rather from the root. Believers, whether white or black, are branches of the true vine. There is to be no special heaven for the white man and another heaven for the black man. We are all to be saved through the same grace, all to enter the same heaven at last. Then why not act like rational beings and overcome our unlikeness to Christ? The same God that blesses us as his sons and daughters blesses the colored race. Those who have the faith that works by love and purifies the soul will look with compassion and love upon the colored people. Many of those who have had every advantage 
who have regarded themselves as superior to the colored people because their skin was white will find that many of the colored race will go into heaven before them. That is quite potent. That's the Southern Work, page 55. That's quite, quite powerful. Um, and you can tell that she's addressing some prejudice, racial feelings, racism in her own church. And she's rebuking it and trying to set it right in the biblical way, in the, in the right light. Now, there are plenty of other statements, but I want to just read one more here in terms of setting the larger framework for our statement. And this is published in Manuscript, Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 16 and 17. This was actually, um, this essay was written or published in, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, it is a, it's a letter. This letter was written in 1900. So this is really a year before our statement we're addressing, which was 1901. Here's what she wrote in this letter. In regard to the question of caste and color, nothing would be gained by making a decided distinction, but the Spirit of God would be grieved. In other words, as I read in the previous statement, a distinction, making a distinction between the races grieves God. Now, when we get to the next episode, there are some statements that may seem quite different, almost contradictory to some of the things she's saying in the statements I'm reading to you now. We'll get to that, and we will examine them fully in that episode. But continuing here, we are all supposed to be preparing for the same heaven. We have the same Heavenly Father and the same Redeemer who loved us and gave Himself for us all without any distinction. We are nearing the close of this earth's history, and it does not become any child of God to have a proud, haughty heart and turn from any soul who loves God or to cease to labor for any soul for whom Christ has died. When the love of Christ is cherished in the heart as it should be, when the sweet, subduing spirit of the love of God fills the soul temple, there will be no caste, no pride of nationality, no difference will be made because of the color of the skin. Each one will help the one who needs tender regard and consolation of whatever nationality he may be. Now here's where she really brings it home. Ask yourselves if Christ would make any difference. In assembling his people, would he say, Here, brother, or here, sister, your nationality is not Jewish. You are of a different class. Would he say, Those who are dark skin may file into the back seats. Those of a lighter skin may come up to the front seats. In one place, the proposition was made that a curtain be drawn between the colored people and the white people. I asked, would Jesus do that? This grieves the heart of Christ. The color of the skin is no criterion as to the value of the soul. By the mighty cleaver of truth, we have all been quarried out from the world. God has taken us, all classes, all nations, all languages, all nationalities, and brought us into his workshop to be prepared for his temple. So very clear, very clear. There are many other statements, but those are some, some quite powerful ones that I think help us see the, the larger framework of what Ellen White believes about the races and how they all stand before God. Now, I've heard critics say, well, look, you have these nice statements, but she contradicts them. And they pull that from the essay we're going to look at in the next episode. And they say, look how this contradicts. And uh, I hear some of the, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. There's a new wave, a new wave of, uh, as I mentioned, criticisms of Adventism and Ellen White. Uh, and I'm going to be addressing this new wave in some other venues, in fact. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, shortly, I will be uh, on the Adventist Defense League discussing some things, and also I'm going to get together with my colleagues 
Matthew Lucio, the, my podcast colleagues, Matthew and Greg and Michael, and we're going to, to get together again like we did in the cultish uh, episodes on uh, Adventist pilgrimage. And we're going to address some of the charges against the Adventist understanding and Ellen White's understanding of the Trinity. So those things are up ahead. So in light of this, it's it's just it's it's becoming so intense. And you listen to the the material about Ellen White uh, and these statements, and you know they're just driving home as as forcefully as possible the idea that Ellen White was clearly a racist. It doesn't matter what she said; her racist statements, they say, cancels out her positive statements about the black race. Let me give you a little story, if I may. I'm going to interrupt before I get to the immediate context of our statement, and I want to share with you a little bit of my background. I grew up in Alabama. I have had relatives who fought in the Confederate Army in the Civil War. So I kind of had this in the background of my family. When I came to Christ, um, and was baptized as a, as a young, 17 years old, as a young man. When I, when I came to Christ, I, I had a background of, of you know, racism in the public schools that I attended and, and experiencing that. And, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget when I was baptized by immersion, the Tennessee River went down into that water and came up. It was of course, biblically, baptism is a you know, rising up into newness of life and, and a declaration to, to the world that you're, you're new in Christ. And I tell you, for me, it was in so many ways, and one of them was with regard to racism. It, a miracle happened in my heart. God instantly took away any racial feelings. It was gone. To this day, I have never felt any sense of prejudice, not a bit towards anyone of a different race than mine, particularly the, the black race, because I grew up in the South. God took that away. To me, that's, that's just a miracle. Now, I wish he would have taken away other challenges I've had in my spiritual life. Um, but that one, that one he took away. And uh, that's why I have, um, I've always felt very strong about the oneness of every human being before God and the equality of all. Well, fast forward years, I'm a young Adventist pastor and I'm pastoring in Mississippi, several churches, and I'm not going to say where this event happened, but I shall never forget it as long as I live. It was in the winter and I was preaching a sermon in this small church full of white people, okay? Caucasian, a little Caucasian church. In the wintertime, you had a, a, an Adventist organization that they would plant trees in that area. So we called them tree planters. And they would usually come in during the, the winter months and worship with us because they were Adventist. The organization was Adventist and they hired Adventist. And so they would come on Sabbath and they would plant the trees during the week and and just be there during the, that period in the winter, and then they would go and wouldn't see him again until the next year. Well, I'll never forget, I'm preaching, I'm preaching this Sabbath, and in walks a nice black family, children and their parents, and they sit down in the pews. I was shocked at what happened. Half, over half of that church defiantly stood to their feet and stormed out the back door. They would not sit in church with that black family. Now, I got to tell you, I was livid. Next Sabbath, next Sabbath, of course, my wife and I, we took the family in and had them for dinner and had a good time. But the next Sabbath, when the church was there, church was full, everybody was there, I tell you what I did. I sent them all to hell. 
I mean, I put that little church in the deepest bowels of hell. I made it clear that if you have any racist feelings, you will, and you, you are a racist, and you believe that any group of people is inferior to you, you will not be in heaven. I mean, I tore into them. And to this day, years later, as a teacher of preachers, I have never regretted that. And if I ever encounter it again, I'm going to do the same thing because it's clearly wrong. And so for me, as I've read Ellen White over the years with that background, um, that was the one one of the many aspects, I should say, that I've deeply appreciated about her writings is the, the oneness of, of all humans and these wonderful statements, and they bless me. And so I've got to tell you, if, if the critics were right and Ellen White was a racist, even if she had just a, a thread of, of authentic racism in her statements and in her teaching in her life, if that, if, if that were the case and the critics were right, let me tell you, I would have rejected her a long, long time ago. But I don't see it. I don't see it. The, the statements I just shared, I see that running through all of her statements, including the one that we're addressing today. So maybe that background will illuminate a little bit where, more where I'm coming from, why I feel strong about this issue. Uh, that to me, it's just so unfair to just automatically read into these statements with no real attention to the context, racism. Now, I am noticing that more recent critics are starting to address the context, but as I listen to their, to their arguments, I still don't find it to be really fair to the whole context. So that's why I'm addressing this now. So let's, let's look at the immediate context, and I've not heard any critic take this statement and, and analyze it in the actual document in which it occurs. So I want to do that with you briefly now in that larger framework that I've just presented. So this is, here's the specifics. This is a sermon she preached in March of 1901. It was a Sabbath service on March 16, 1901 at a colored church or a black church in Vicksburg, Mississippi, the deep South. It was later published in the Gospel Herald March 1901, pages four through five. The title was The Trust in God. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she's sharing with these, this black audience, and she's preaching from John 14. And she uses those texts and, and discusses them and uh, applies it to the audience and gives them promises of, of Christ love for them and attention to them. Here's a few select statements. And you can tell that a part of the burden of the sermon is to encourage these people because of the oppression that they have come out of from slavery, as well as what they're still experiencing in terms of racism and oppression. So here's some of the things she says, and this leads up to our statement. Believe that he loves you and that he will help you, even he, as he has promised. If you will believe, you will have confidence, trust, reliance, and rich blessings, because you will realize that Christ is the foundation of your faith. Another... Skipping another paragraph, she said, this promise God has made to you. She's just cited uh, several texts there in John 14. When you get discouraged, do not depend upon human beings for aid. Christ declares the comforter shall be with you. Go right to God in prayer. Bow before him saying, Lord, help me for I am in difficulty and I do not know what to do. You have promised to give your children what they ask in your name. We ask for strength to resist the temptations of the enemy. If you see that your character is defective, she went on to say, do not go away and forget what manner of person you are. Strive earnestly to overcome your faults. As you do this, the joy of heaven will fill your heart. There is strength in the Savior. He wants his children to banish all selfishness from the heart, that he may enter as an abiding guest that his righteousness may go before them and the glory of God be their reward. Now, the next paragraph is the one which contains our statement. It reads, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You are the children of God. He has adopted you, and he desires you to form characters here that will give you entrance into the heavenly family. Remember this, you will be 
able to bear the trials which you meet here. In heaven, there will be no color line, for we will be as white as Christ himself. Let us thank God that we can be members of the royal family. Now, of course, the trials that you meet here, that feeds right into, in heaven there will be no color line. Some of the trials, the major trial they were facing was the color line. What is the color line? That was segregation at that time. Uh, Inequality, racism, it was the, the distinction between the whites and the blacks. And the blacks were considered inferior and had less opportunities and were banned from certain places. It was inequality and racism based on skin color. And she says, in heaven, there will be no color line. No skin color, really. That's the background. The contrast, that is, for all will be as white as Christ himself. Now, I've heard some say that when she says, let us thank God that we could be members of the royal family, that's the royal white family. And that she's saying that Christ is white. We know Christ was a Palestinian Jew. He had a darker colored skin. He was not white like the Anglo races um, or Anglo race. But that just doesn't really um, fit with what's going on here. Because she has said, children of God, he has adopted you. The royal family is to be part of the family of God. Does she mean white like Christ in terms of a racist white connotation? Or does she mean something else related to the biblical concept of white? So what what is going on here? Let's look at some parallel statements. Some parallel statements. That, that's the, oh, by the way, I'm not finished yet. I just uh, jumped ahead of myself. Uh, there's two paragraphs left in this document of this sermon. And let me go to the last paragraph because I think this helps clarify uh, the issue as well. She's, this is the last paragraph of the sermon. I want you to realize that Christ is a personal Savior. Show to the world what he can do even through the weakest of human beings. Now, she's not undermining them as a people, but weakest human. They were oppressed. They had great challenges. And so that's the idea. She considered herself, especially in her early years, as one of the weakest of human beings because of her challenges and struggles. So she goes on, work out before the world the principles of righteousness. Obey the commandments. Demonstrate the power of truth. This is the most powerful witness you can bear in favor of the truth, but you are not to do this in your own strength. You are to work in the strength and the grace that God gives. Thus, you can walk in his footsteps, cling to the mighty Redeemer, who is also your elder brother. God desires us to seek earnestly for a place among the number who will stand around his throne to every sincere follower, white or black. He will say, Come, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So the overall message is a united message between black and white. That Christ is the elder brother of all of us. That we will all stand together in unity around his throne. Every sincere follower, white or black. So it just doesn't make sense in light of the whole document that When she said, as white as Christ himself, she had some form of white supremacy. Um, That just doesn't fit at all. Now, two other parallel statements that I think illuminate what she meant by white as Christ himself. If you really read Ellen White through carefully, holistically, repeatedly, she really knew her Bible. And biblical imagery flows through her writings, like bloods through our veins. You know, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the famous prince of preachers of the 19th century, he talked about Christians who really read the Bible, their, their blood will be bibline, as he put it. Well, I would submit that Ellen White's blood, figuratively speaking, was bibline because uh, the Bible just flowed out of her, her writings and her speaking 
and her thinking. So with that in mind, let's look at uh, some other statements here that I think will help clarify what she meant by white as Christ himself. This is letter, uh, a letter, and interestingly, a lot of these statements are from letters that she was writing to individuals, and this helps us really get into her thinking. And this is the basic time period that she made this statement. This is letter 165, written in 1899, just a couple of years before she made this statement we're discussing. She wrote, There is evidence that God is at work among the downtrodden race, referring, of course, to the black race after slavery. We want the evidence that God is at work among professed Christians who have the advantage of a white skin. Now that she does, there's nothing racist in that. She's just speaking of a historical fact. The whites had not been through slavery and oppression. So in that sense, they had an advantage. She several times refers to that in her writings contrasting the experience of the whites with that of the blacks. The whites had not been through slavery. In that sense, they had an advantage. So she said, we want the evidence that God is at work among professed Christians who have the advantage of a white skin. What? That they might respond to the Lord's favors and reveal that they have the advantage of far higher estimate in His sight. What is that advantage? The advantage of a pure white soul, a soul washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. That is a phrase she uses repeatedly, made white in the blood of the Lamb. Now that statement, that sentence, I think I'm going to read it again because you have to really follow it to understand. She's not saying that whites are better and have a better advantage here. She's speaking of, the, uh, of those who've had the technical advantage of white skin during that period. Then she says again, Would that they might respond to the Lord's favors and reveal that they have the advantage of far higher estimate in His sight. What is that? The advantage of a pure white soul, a soul washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, she's transcending skin color. That's not the real advantage. The real advantage is being pure in Christ and being made white in the blood of the Lamb. Now that is a phrase, an image, that comes from Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. That's a statement, a verse, and this phrase made white in the blood of the blood of the blood, excuse me, blood of the Lamb. She says it about a little short. I should say, a little short of about 300 times throughout her writings. So it's, it's a statement she referred to often, and you find it frequently in the context of dealing with the black race. The black and the white race, really. She goes on in this statement, in this letter, 165, 1899. Now she's just talked about the whites having something beyond skin color, a white soul washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. So it's not the racial whiteness here. It's the biblical concept of whiteness, which is purity in Christ's righteousness. Next paragraph reads, There is a variety of talents used in the Lord's work. God uses whoever are converted and sanctified to His service. The ignorant outcast, the heathen, the European, the slave. These are Christ by creation and by redemption, no matter who they are. There is no case in heaven. All who believe in Christ as a personal Savior, whatever their position, whether they be high or low, rich or poor, black or white, are Christ bought with a price. If converted from sin to holiness, they are members of the royal family, children of the heavenly King heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, His well-beloved brethren who will walk with Him in white because they are worthy. See, all, all who believe in Christ as a personal Savior will walk with Him in white because they are worthy. Red, yellow, black, or white. That's the idea here. She goes on. Those who are now 
looked upon as lords, great men of the earth, will be glad when their intelligence shall see what is the only source of true nobility, to go to heaven and associate with those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, even though their skin is as black as coal. What an interesting statement, a profound statement by itself and in this connection of our discussion. The, in other words, look, we're still going to have our ethnic identities in heaven, red, yellow, black, white. But ultimately, we're going to be covered in Christ's robe of righteousness, made white in the blood of the Lamb, the biblical white, the Christ white, which is purity in His righteousness. That's very clear as you read the statement in its context. She goes on. Well, I should say, uh, before I get to that, let me just clarify that we will still have our race distinction in heaven, but we will all be white in Christ righteousness. That's the idea. Letter 304, 1903. We skip a years now, a few years. This is ahead uh, of the statement, or after the statement, I should say. So that 1899 statement we just read, that, I think, provides some clarity in what she meant by white as Christ. But here's letter 304, 1903, a couple of years after the statement. If Christ makes the colored race clean and white in the blood of the Lamb, if He clothes them with the garments of His righteousness, then they will be honored in the heavenly kingdom as verily as the white. And when the Lord Jesus' face shall shine upon the righteous black, they will shine forth in the very same complexion that Christ has. Now that is clearly a parallel statement, I think, to ours, oh, the one we're addressing now. The same complexion, that uh, alludes to several verses that speak of being like Christ and letting His light shine from us. It certainly brings to mind 2 Corinthians 3.18. This, is prop this was most likely in the background of her thinking. 2 Corinthians 3.18 but we all, and by the way, this is a statement that she often used in many different connections. But we all with unveiled, veiled face, behold and reflecting like a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord Spirit. So we look into Christ's face and His face shines upon us, His light, His glory, His character, and we reflect that as a bright light. And in heaven, that's, that's the idea. She's not talking about white skin. She's not talking about white racism on this earth. She's talking about the heavenly white that is only from the righteousness of Christ. His robe of righteousness. Now here's a key statement. I think this one really brings clarity in my thinking to this whole issue. And this is from the Southern Work, page 22. Those who are converted among the colored race will be cleansed from sin, will wear the white robe of Christ righteousness, which has been woven in the loom of heaven. I'm going to stop there and comment. Woven in the loom of heaven. It's not something earthy. It's something heavenly. This concept of white is heavenly. It transcends any ethnic connotation. This is above that. That's what she's talking about. The white robe of Christ, righteousness, woven in the loom of heaven that all believers will wear. That transcends any connotation of racism and how we use it here. So we're talking about the biblical concept of white, and that's what Ellen White meant very clearly, I believe. She said in the next sentence, both white and colored people 
must enter into the path of obedience through the same way. Letter 27, 1871. We go back now a couple of decades. But I want to show you this as a theme in her writings, in her thinking. She's writing to her own children now. Children, let us as a family wash our robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. We must be earnest, self-possessed, firm, decided, and persevering if we are overcomers and have on the white robe of Christ righteousness, a fitness for the society of heavenly angels, for the mansions Jesus has gone to prepare for those who love him. See the white robe of Christ righteousness in her thinking, that is the fitness for the society of the heavenly angels. And again, that is a biblical concept. She's drawing that right from Scripture, Revelation 7.14. Letter 117, 1901. She wrote, Believers must shine as lights in the world in readiness for the Lord's coming. Readiness for the Lord's appearing is now to be earnestly sought for. The church of the living God is to be put is to put on her beautiful garments the white robe of Christ righteousness that she may be ready and waiting for the summons. So this concept of the white robe of Christ righteousness righteousness is a theme that runs through her writings and it's drawn from biblical language. White robe of Christ righteousness. That has nothing to do with the connotation of white skin in an earthly manner. Manuscript 70, 1902. All people of whatever nationality are amenable to the same law. All will be judged according to their deeds all, both white and black, have the same offer of salvation. God has given to all the promise of the same heaven on the same terms. So you hear this sense of equality in heaven. Oneness, equality, sameness in heaven on the same terms, which is faith in Christ alone. Red, yellow, black, or white, that is consistent with Ellen White. Manuscript 14, 1904. If the white church is to become a holy temple for God, the character building of the members must be after the character building of the meek and lowly Jesus. If the black man has given himself to God as his child, let him believe that he is just as precious in his sight as are his white children. You see, again, she's dealing with that prejudice that she had unfortunately frequently, frequently encountered in her church. And listen, it is a sad fact, but it is a fact. There is racism in the history of our church. And I cover this. I've been doing it for a quarter of a century, teaching the class Adventist Heritage. And at the beginning of the semester, I always tell them, I do not plan to sweep anything under the rug. We're going to deal with all the issues and mistakes and challenges the church has had. And one of them is racism in our history. I have an entire lecture on a history of the black people and the black work in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I cover all of these issues. And I deal with the unfortunate incidents related to racism in the church during Ellen White's lifetime and after she died. It's a sad fact. But within her writings, you find none of that. If only, historically and presently, we heeded her writings. So continuing in this paragraph, I just read, if the black man has given himself to God as his child, let him believe that he is just as precious in his sight as are his white children. He may lift his head toward the light and become a partaker of the divine nature. It is his privilege to reveal the character of Christ. By the divine presence, he may be transformed in heart and mind, and from him may radiate heaven's dazzling beams. Christ may shine forth from him the perfection of all righteousness. Notice, Christ may shine forth from him. That goes back to the earlier statement, reflect his complexion. That, I believe, is what she meant. To reflect Christ's complexion is to 
let Christ shine forth from him the perfection of all righteousness. She's talking about black people here. The glory of the Savior is his defense. There's no question that Ellen White was pro-black and a defender of this oppressed people of that era. Letter 304, 1908. God has marked out no color line. The, uh, and men should move very guardedly, lest we offend God. The Lord has not made two heavens, one for the white people and one for the colored people. This is but one heaven for the saved. All who enter heaven will enter, not through their own merit, but through the merits of Christ, God's gift to the world. So those set of statements, I think, provide parallel connections to our statement, white as Christ himself. But the question remains, why this phrase before this audience at this time? That's the only place she used it. Why didn't she use Christ's robe of righteousness instead of white as Christ himself? That, that's a fair question. That is a fair question. It's a fair challenge. But in light of everything that I've shared here, I think it could be put this way. What Ellen White was doing, in a simple way, she was directing the minds of her audience away from skin color to the pure white righteousness of Christ, his robe of righteousness. She was seeking to encourage them. In other words, the, the biblical white, that's what she was directing them to, not the racist caricature of white. No question, it's, it's a difficult statement for our 21st century minds. But when taken in the setting of the black, again, when taken in the setting of the black audience that she spoke to in Vicksburg, Mississippi, March of 1901, it would have been a blessing to these people, I believe, drawing their minds to heaven when they'd been so oppressed by whites, so oppressed, would draw their minds to heaven where we will all be one in Christ and as Revelation 7.14 puts it, we would be standing in our washed robes. They, they, this black audience, would be standing in their washed robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. I am sure that audience had a biblical understanding. And when she said white as Christ in their minds, they understood that in a biblical way. But it was also stated in a way that would bring them encouragement that they could have all the advantages that the white people of their day had and so much more when they're in heaven. And there would be no more color line, the very grammar of the statement, no color line, no segregation, no inequality based on skin color. That's over. To conclude, we shouldn't read this statement through our 21st century eyes with all our racial tension and political correctness. Taken in its historical and literary setting, Ellen White was not adding insult to injury by telling this black audience that they would all be white-skinned in heaven. A month later at the General Conference proceedings, she reflected on her sermon before this black church. When I was in Vicksburg, I was so pleased to see in the congregation which assembled on the Sabbath men of intelligence and real moral worth. I wanted to leave the room, for I felt that I should have to weep. I seldom shed a tear, not even when my dead are before me. Their work is done, and they are at rest. But when I see something that makes my heart glad, the tears will come. Elsewhere, she said of the black race, my heart is very tender toward all the colored race. That's letter 4, 1894. That this woman of such deep feelings for the black race would say something racially hurtful to that audience sitting before her on March 16, 1901, doesn't fit who Ellen White was, nor does it fit the context of the sermon she preached to them. Let's recap the wording of the statement. In heaven, there will be no color line. That is, in heaven, there will be no more racial discrimination based on a person's skin, no more division or marginalization based on race, 
No more systemic inequalities. No more societal and institutional boundaries. No, heaven will have none of these curses. The contrast in the sentence is a place, heaven, where we will all be white as Christ. As we've seen so far, for Ellen White, the concept of white in this setting is based on the biblical idea to be pure and clean through the righteousness of Christ. We are all sinful and wear filthy rags. Our title and fitness for heaven is the righteousness of Christ, that is, his robe of righteousness. Ellen White apparently drew from Revelation 7-9, which speaks of the great multitude in heaven who were wearing white robes. Hence, she spoke often of the white robe of Christ, righteousness. As we noted earlier, she emphasized that in heaven, it is not the color of a person's skin, but character that counts. She also drew from Revelation 7.14 that speaks of washed robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. That last phrase, I believe, is the key to unlocking the understanding in her mind when she spoke of being white as Christ himself. Additionally, you have Revelation 3 and the white garment in verses 4, 5, and 18. To be white as Christ himself, then, is to be cleansed by his blood and made righteous through the wearing of his white robe of righteousness. In other words, it is a white garment that she meant, not white skin. She was clear, as we noted earlier, that we will still retain our various ethnic identities in heaven, yet be one in Christ because he covers us in his spotless, pure robe made of a whiteness that transcends any skin color in this world. This interpretation harmonizes with the immediate and larger literary context of her writings, and I believe is a fair one. Now, friends, please, you should investigate these statements for yourself. Don't take my word for it or any critic's word for it. I encourage you to study this issue for yourself and come to your own conclusion. All of these statements are available by anyone who wants to study them and their context. Here are a couple of resources that you can study as well. Kevin Morgan wrote a helpful book entitled Journeying to the Same Heaven, Ellen White, the Civil War, and the Goal of Post-Racialism. Also, you want to especially look at the work of historian Benjamin Baker, who has put together everything Ellen White said about the black race and its context. His website is full of helpful resources. That address is www.blacksdahistory.org. Click on the link, Ellen White and Blacks. This very helpful material puts everything in context. All right, friends, that's it for now. Remember my next episode, a bonus episode, will address several other controversial statements by Ellen White, often used by her critics to show that she was a racist. After that, my regular episode next month will discuss the famous amalgamation of man and beast statement. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, God bless.